You're listening to Storytime in Paris on Paris Underground Radio. For more great content and to join our book club, please join us on Patreon. Since well before Victor Hugo looked up at Notre Dame and thought, huh, what if a hunchback lived in there? Authors have been inspired by Paris. Welcome to the Storytime in Paris podcast on Paris Underground Radio, where we keep that tradition alive by showcasing an author with a French connection in each episode. Every episode will feature five questions asked by you, our author's biggest fans, and answered live on air. Then our authors will treat us to a reading of an excerpt from their book. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity. Would you like to join the Storytime in Paris book club? Head on over to patreon.com slash Paris Underground Radio and stay tuned to the end of this episode for more information. Happy Halloween. I have a very special guest today in honor of All Hallows Eve, Michel de Nostradam, better known as Nostradamus. Nostradamus was a French astrologer, apothecary, physician, and seer, often using his talents to aid French royalty. Since his first prediction in 1555, people the world over have been decoding and deciphering Nostradamus's book, Les Prophéties, to see what insight it can give into the future. And now, thanks to the lovely and talented Eve Galois, who has previously been on the podcast channeling Victor Hugo and Georges Sand, I was able to speak with him directly. This conversation ended up being much more deeply philosophical than I'd imagined. You'll hear he takes a little while to warm up to me, and I've taken the liberty of editing out long pauses. But by the end of our conversation, he's much more open and verbose. When Eve has an insight of her own, she'll say so, but she indicates that she's channeling again with a visual cue. So you can imagine that when I'm speaking again, I'm speaking directly to Nostradamus. This was an intense conversation and one I'll be thinking about for years to come. And with that, please allow me to introduce Monsieur Michel de Nostradam, or Nostradamus, author of The Prophecies. Hi, Eve. Thank you so much for joining me again on Storytime in Paris. Thank you very much for having me. It's such a joy to have you. I love these episodes. Can you tell our listeners, for people who may not know, who you are and what you do, a little bit about yourself? So I'm a human being. Uh, I work in life coaching and I, I'm one of these people who have some sensitivities, some abilities regarding a sixth sense. And I've uh, worked on my ability to channel other people's spirits, not as in ghosts, because I'm not channeling from the outside in like Ouija board. Don't ever do that. But I believe that if we are all one, it means I am able to access anything from anything, anywhere, in time and space. So I could actually have a notion of what your dog feels, what your apartment feels when you're in there. And uh, so I'm able to channel the part of myself who is a specific person and get an insight of what they feel regarding the questions you ask. And so it's more of like a sensation than words or images, things like that? I would say it's very much like when you think yourself. Depending on the person, uh, on the character, let's say I'm channeling, I will have uh, just a notion of feeling of, mm, yes, no. Sometimes I will have real insight, like suddenly I think about two kids. I have no idea this person has kids, but this is the actual feeling. So I will have uh, sometimes very clear stuff, sometimes not. And if you listen to Victor Hugo uh, episode, for example, that was very fun because Victor had a crush on you, Jen. <laughs> that was a very fun episode. That was fun for me too. I was trying to think, so we've done Victor Hugo and George Sand. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to think of someone for this Halloween episode. I was trying to think of someone who's somehow like associated with Halloween, who's French. And Halloween isn't a very big deal in France, historically. So uh, I was digging around. The first thought I had was the uh, Marquis de Sade. <laughs> and I just thought, okay. Oh, no, please don't make me do Marquis de Sade. It's No. This is a hard limit for me. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, for me too. <laughs> so we're going with uh, Nostradamus. So you're going to channel or get in touch with Nostradamus for us. Mm -hmm. So specifically, uh, Nostradamus is very well known. And just like a movie star, 
when you think about them, you have your own idea of who this person is. So I will not be channeling Nostradamus because Nostradamus is the idea of the collective about this person. I will specifically ask to channel Michel de Nostradamus, which is the actual name of the person. And so when I speak to him through you, should I call him Michel? Yes, please. Except if you, you can ask him what he wants to be called. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we did that with, uh, with George. Yes, because she was a very special, very interesting uh, episode with gender fluid issues and stuff like this. Yes. And so remind us when you, sometimes you have insights as Eve about these people. So you'll tell us. So remind us how you'll go about it. I will probably say this is Eve speaking. So, you know, I'm giving you a feeling that maybe the person does not want to express or does not find a word to express. So you still get the information, even if the character is not able. For example, uh, if you do Lewis Carroll, he had a stutter. So sometimes he would not talk, but you could get the full sentences inside his mind. Interesting. Okay. All right. Well, I'm ready. So whenever you're ready. Okay. Just give me a few seconds. So I want to really thank you for taking the time to be here with me today. Would you like me to call you Michel or Nostradamus or something else? Sir, would be fine. Thank you. Some respect, please. Okay, absolutely. Well, sir, I want to thank you for being here. And my first question is, what has it been like for you to watch us here on Earth in the past 500 years as we live through the predictions that you forecast? Oh. This is Eve speaking. I'm getting an insight of heaviness, of uh, there is a lot, lot, lot happening, and some sort of disconnection regarding the consequences of what he wrote and uh, not truly really being interested in what's happening, actually. Can I ask how your prophecies appear to you? I'm sorry, I have an intruder on my lap right now. This is a furry animal. Why are you here? This is Eve speaking. My cat just jumped on my lap. And uh, I have a notion this uh, person does not like cats or female very much. Oh, interesting. There is a feeling of annoyance for not being the center of the of the attention again and having something taking up his his um attention. Okay, you will have to ask the question again because this has gone like into the cat. <laughs> <laughs> so how do your prophecies appear to you? You are asking me to reveal a trade secret. Let me rephrase. So when, without being specific, do they come across to you as visual or audio or sensory? Visual. So you see a vision and then you interpret it for us. Yes. Okay. And I know that you purposely obscured these prophecies from us. When they appear to you, are they clear? Not really, but I'm telling you, this is it is very annoying to have this cat just putting its clothes into the cushion at my side. This is very, very annoying. I'm having a very hard time keeping my focus on to you. This is Eve speaking. I have the notion that maybe he was ADHD or something. Maybe something with the sensory, um, hypersensory things. So I'll just slightly push the cat away and hope that she does not come back. Let's get back to it. So I know that you purposely obscured your prophecies from us. When they appear to you, are they clear? Not really. It's more of a potential. You see a lot of paths available. The clearest is the one that people will take if they stay in their current path. But the collective can decide to change paths. And when these 
prophecies, these paths appear, do you have a sense of chronology? Do you have a sense of when they're going to happen? No. No, I have a sense of, I don't know what these things are that can tell me it's not contemporary, but no. Why did you choose poetry as the medium to share these prophecies with us? <laughs> to make sure some people would never read them. <laughs> It's And also to make sure some people would read them. Because sometimes you need the heart to understand something, not only the brain. And if you are being very objective, very straightforward, it will go to the brain. There will be no feeling associated with it. So you will not actually understand the full intent the full meaning of it. You will not be able to truly connect to it. I see. That makes sense. I know that you left the, there was a foreword in your prophecies for your son. Do you think that your son had these gifts as well? Yeah. And do you consider your gift to be a blessing or a curse? Sometimes the one, sometimes the other. It's, it's hard to bear sometimes. But I suppose we are all here with a purpose. God has a plan. So we are here to deliver something to this world and then be removed from the world. So I'm here to deliver what I've been meant to deliver. Do you have any predictions or prophecies that you regret sharing? Sometimes all of them. But sometimes I remember that... I have a part to play in the world, in the universe, in the timeline. So I would not have received the information if it was not meant to be given to someone. And can I ask why you might regret it? Because sometimes people look at my words with their brains instead of their hearts, so they misinterpret it. And the consequences are not the ones that were expected. So I would say the word is backfire. So they've taken what you've given them and misinterpreted and had a path other than the one you were maybe showing them. Mm -hmm. Okay. And on the other side of that, do you have a prediction that you're most proud of? How can I be proud of something that is God-given? Do you know if there are other people around you or in your time who had these gifts as well? I would say a lot of humans have these gifts, but we are taught not to listen. We are taught to forget, which was good for me as I was the one listening, so I was the one, the only one, maybe, spreading the word. And does it surprise you that now, almost 500 years later, we're still listening to you, still reading your words, still interpreting what you've said? Uh, yes and no. It's surprising me that so much credit is still given to something that might not be on your path anymore. But it does not surprise me because people usually grab at something that is in the past. Just like the foundations, the lower walls of an old house. Because this seems solid and secure and safe. So they will decide to just hold on to this instead of actually living and let it go of what does not serve them anymore. Have you always dreamed of owning a place in Paris? If you're planning on moving, renting, buying, or selling a place in France, you'll need the expert guidance of Gail Boisclair and Marie Pissinier, hosts of the Paris Estate of Mind podcast. Listen now to Paris Estate of Mind on parisundergroundradio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be right back with Storytime in Paris after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Storytime in Paris. 
Do you have a sense of the world as it is now in 2022? Do you think that we react to these prophecies differently than people did in your time? In my time, less people could read. Less people had access to the raw wording. They had access to someone interpreting the words already because when you read something, you put intention into it, you put emotion into it. So it was already distorted. But I I am getting a notion very interesting about the prophecy about the solar eclipse that some people, I understand, interpreted it as some object, massive object falling from the skies. 1998, I think. This should be it, yes. But it was not. It was just a solar eclipse. We had no massive object in space in my time. Ah, I see. Do you think that there's a a part of us as humans that naturally goes to the doomsday, really negative, dark interpretations? This question is almost philosophical or religious. It's complicated. We tend to remember the, the thing that we fear most and make it happen. Just so because it happens, it's done and we do not have to fear it anymore. Do we all have this? Probably at some level. But we do not need to have it, actually. That's a brilliant answer. Thank you. This is Eve speaking. Receiving this uh, compliment feels strange. <laughs> As in, do I answer? Is it presumptuous? How do I react? Do I just take it? Why is she complimenting me on something so logical? So this is a very interesting reaction. Are there any unfulfilled prophecies that you're looking forward to? Hundreds and thousands, but not ones I've written. Oh. We have prophecies all the time. This whole universe, this life, is made of prophecies that are to be fulfilled. So I'm looking at your world like it is a field of flowers that will or will not bloom. This is what prophecies look like in my mind. Oh. Can I ask you a more specific question? Can you tell me a little bit about your relationship with uh, Catherine de' Medici? This is Eve speaking. Um, I have a notion of an ease. Um, it's in the in the spine. It's starting to to shift a bit. Um, it's uh, maybe not shame, but more of a. I don't know if I can talk about it. How will she take my words if she hears them? Th that is a kind of feeling I'm getting. Like betraying a trust? Not betraying a trust, but more of a um, wanting to be seen as good or proper in the eyes of this person. This is this is the the notion I'm getting. It's about uh, if I say something wrong, I will lose her respect, and uh, we have to keep this maybe trust actually, but more of a respect feel of it. Is there anything you'd like to share about your relationship with Catherine de Medici? You do not have to, obviously. This woman, she had balls. She dared to act. She dared to live. She took action and owned her power in this world. She owned the responsibility of what she did and the consequences of it. I admire her for acting against things and people and moral sometimes, or a lot of times, to actually make change happen. This 
is more than most humans do when living on this planet. Most are just waiting for life to happen to them. She grabbed at life. She took actions that still have repercussions in your time. She is one of the people I would not put in a box of good or evil. She was just owning her free will. And I respect that. Did you foresee the death of her husband, Henry II? No, but I didn't want to. That's interesting. Do you... So when you're thinking of these paths for the future, are there ones that you stop yourself from looking down? There are millions, millions of paths. You would die before looking at just a portion of them all. This is why we are only presented with the most potent path available. And what we do is try and stir the world into the path that seems the less deadly, let's say. You said before we've deviated from some of these paths that you predicted, but are there still predictions that you made that hold true for us today? No. All those I have given you have already come true, as in if they had to happen on this specific path you are in. I don't know if you pay any attention to the media of today, but there's a television channel in the United States called the History Channel, and they talk about you and your work a lot. Do you have any feelings about that? This is Eve speaking. Um, I'm getting a feeling of mild annoyance. <laughs> Uh, and not wanting to comment on the topic. But it's uh, it's really a... Why would I try and do anything about this? Because they can say anything they want. I am not here to actually be able to contradict uh, their uh, statements. And no one can actually currently contradict them and them taking the contradiction seriously. Can I ask how you feel about the world's perception of you in general? Do you think that there's anything we've really misunderstood? It's complicated to talk about what the world thinks of me because there are people who think positively, people who think negatively, people who have no idea I've existed, people who have no idea my work existed or exists. And I would say that myself, as this one person, I'm just a vessel. I'm not so important as you should dig into the life I've lived. Stop stop digging into the past. Just live into the present. I gave you, or I gave them, let's say, insight of possible futures. So they would actually look from the present towards the future instead of looking into the past. I guess I feel a bit annoyed. Are there people and spirits and beings alive on the planet now who are doing what you did in a way that you find respectful and productive? There are people who do this. Now, do I feel this is respectful and productive? These are two adjectives that do not apply fully at the same time to all of these people. Now, I'm not spending all my energy looking for people who would be copycats. I like this word, copycats. It's like printing, but with humans. Uh, I will not spend this energy into trying to find these people because 
I, as an entity, as a being, will be of no help to them. So can I ask you if you're willing, we're about to leave 2022 behind and we're moving into 2023. Are there any prophecies for the next year that you might be able to share with us? This is Eve speaking. Uh, If I'm going to tell you anything, it's basically images of fleshes I'm getting. So I cannot actually give you a prophecy or these are just feelings and possibilities and potentials that are valid if no one on this planet changes their mind about anything they've decided to do in the next 40 days, let's say. So what I'm going to tell you here, if anything really comes up, will maybe not be valid, may actually be happening. I have no idea. So I'll be uh, trying to get something for you. Fields of light, warmth, but hunger and pain, and in the water hope, hearts to gain. Thank you very much. Is there anything you'd like to share with us? If I, I know you said you don't really have a way to connect with people now. I don't know if that interests you, but I want to offer you the time now. If there's anything you want to say or share, is there anything you'd like us to know? Do not spend too much time trying to make sense of the words. Listen to your own voice. Listen to these words in your own voice. Feel in your body, feel in your heart and feel in your mind because these know the true meaning of the words, which are just a vessel for the message. Do not dwell too much on two words of old for they are not life. These words are dead already, once spoken, once written. So go, live, experience, move, move. And because may you move or not move, you will die anyway. This life is a gift for you. So you better move and make the most of it. Thank you very much, Monsieur Notre Dame, for taking the time to be with me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It was actually nice. I enjoyed it. I was mightily annoyed, but I enjoyed it. (laughs) I'll take that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Welcome back. Oh, (laughs) that was interesting. He warmed up. The feeling of... The the person being very, very straight, very rigid in the back, like the body was always tense and always looking for potential danger. This was this constant awareness of what, where, when, whom, all this. Pretty scary. <laughs> was it scary for you? The feeling of it was scary as in it's not a state of mind I'm used to and uh, if anyone listening to this podcast is feeling this on a regular basis please go and see a professional because this is not the natural state of the healthy mind and you could actually be stuck because this is it this is about feeling stuck in your body and not being able to own and enjoy an empowered life Are you searching for spiritual guidance? The Heart of You podcast is an exploration into your soul through intuition, spirituality, divination, and unconditional love. Host Annette Lu is a spiritual guidance coach, intuitive, Akashic, and tarot reader who discusses practical ways to integrate spiritual growth into your everyday life. Listen now to The Heart of You on parisundergroundradio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. And now, back to story time in Paris. I got the sense that there was one very specific way that I had to speak to him or had to approach him in order for him not to be entirely offended and shut down. Yes, uh, it was. It reminded me, actually, of the interviews of Yves Saint Laurent, to whom close questions 
would give a closed answer. Like the question could take three minutes and then you would say yes or no. <laughs> but um, this is why you, when you ask open questions, you got answers, but still it was very efficient. You said the word efficient at some point. And this was it. A man of few and very chosen words. But to that end, he was very clear. He was very clear what his perspective and philosophy was on these things. I guess in the end, the feeling of safety had grown. So he knew he would not be judged for actually giving the authentic truth. This is what I really got. This, If he had lived nowadays, I have a feeling he would have been uh, cast out. Mm. Anyway, because... He had access to notions and feelings and ideas that maybe some of us are not ready to own, to dare and own. Yeah, that's kind of what I was trying to ask, whether he thought like it would be better or worse now in terms of how we would respond to him or this kind of thing. I would say, from what I got, uh, look into the world today at how people who are different yeah. are taken, are regarded, uh, how we respect or not what is not us. I like the idea that he lets people make their own mind, find their own way and their own interpretation of his own words. So I would say let's do that too. I really like the idea too that someone else reading his words to you changed their meaning. That's mm -hmm. very interesting. We find this very often when uh, we study old texts, such as parables in uh, Buddhism, for example. You will read them one time, you will have one interpretation, and a few years later you read them again, and bam, that is another thing you discover. And it's the exact same words. It's just your spirit that was not ready at that time to receive them in this manner. Well, thank you, Eve. Is there anything else you want to share with us? This was uh, quite intense, actually. I really uh, leave this podcast with a sensation of hope for um, our society, for all humanity. But really, we need to start and really work together and not just think one against others. And this is a key message that I will keep from uh, this channeling. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this affected me differently than I thought it would too. I feel like there's a lot that he gave us to think about. So I'm mm -hmm. actually looking forward to thinking about it. I'm looking forward to listening to it again several <laughs> times. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Eve. This was wonderful. It's always a delight to have you on. My pleasure too. I'm going to include a short reading from the introduction of Les Prophéties, which Nostradamus wrote as a letter to his son. It explains a little further why he wrote the way he did. Greetings and happiness to César Nostradame, my son. Your late arrival, César Nostradame, my son, has made me spend much time in constant nightly reflection, so that I could communicate with you by letter, and leave you this reminder after my death, for the benefit of all men, of which the Divine Spirit has vouchsafed me to know by means of astronomy. And since it was the Almighty's will that you were not born here in this region, and I do not want to talk of years to come, but of the months during which you will struggle to grasp and understand the work that I shall be compelled to leave you after my death, assuming that it would not be possible for me to leave you such clearer writing as may be destroyed through the injustice of the age. The key to the hidden prediction which you will inherit will be locked inside my heart. Also bear in mind that the events here described have not yet come to pass, and that all is ruled and governed by the power of Almighty God inspiring us not by Bacchic frenzy nor by enchantments, but by astronomical assurances. Predictions have been made through the inspiration of divine will alone, and the spirit of prophecy in particular. On numerous occasions and over a long period of time, I have predicted specific events far in advance, attributing all of the workings of divine power and inspiration, together with other fortunate or unfortunate happenings, foreseen in their full unexpectedness, which have already come to pass in various regions of the earth. Yet I have wished to remain silent and abandon my work because of the injustice, not only of the present time, but also for most of the future. I will not commit to writing. 
I do not wish to ascribe to myself the title and role of prophet, but emphasize inspiration revealed to a mortal man whose perception is no further from heaven than feet are from the earth. I could not fail, err, or be deceived, although I may be as great a sinner as anyone else upon this earth and subject to all human afflictions. But after being surprised sometimes by day while in a trance and having long fallen into the habit of agreeable nocturnal studies, I have composed books of prophecies, each containing 100 astronomical quatrains, which I want to condense somewhat obscurely. The work comprises prophecies from today to the year 3797. This may perturb some when they see such a long time span, and this will occur and be understood in all the fullness of the Republic. These things will be universally understood upon earth, my son. If you live the normal lifetime of man, you will know upon your own soil, under your native sky, how future events are to turn out. Thank you again to Yves Galois and Nostradamus for making this such an excellent Halloween episode. Please stay safe out there and join me next week when I'll be speaking with author Jordan Stratford about his sword girl book, La Maupin. Check back to see if your questions have been answered and to hear a reading from his book. Join our book club. The Storytime Book Club welcomes authors who have been featured on this podcast to come talk more in depth about their books. Since we keep the podcast spoiler free, this is the perfect chance to get all your specific questions answered. Our next guest will be season premiere guest Kate Reardon discussing her book, The Heat Wave. For more information, including sign up, please join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Paris Underground Radio. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity. You can find me on all socials at Jenny Foria. That's J-E-N-N-Y. P-H-O-R-I-A. Thank you for listening, and until next time, happy reading! This episode of Storytime in Paris was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com.